As you can tell, you guys are doing a great job in the labs. Almost everybody got plus two this week. Even one group that has never got a plus two got a plus two this week. Yay! <laughs> okay, so that's awesome. Um, you're getting your MS lab report. I decided to finish grading MS first, and I'm in the process of grading AA. So you'll get that early next week, along with the exam. The exams, I'm like one-third done <laughs> with them. So on Monday, you'll get both back. And I'm not going to be here on Friday. Klaus is giving the protein analysis lecture for me. But remember, you have a quiz on, is it on Monday? OK, it will be everything up until lecture on Friday. You have questions? Huh? So the Monday quiz will have everything, including Friday's lecture. Yeah. Okay. I already um, I put on Moodle. Okay. Hello. I put on Moodle the key for the exam, so you can have a look uh, on that. And I will also put, uh, there's the quiz three is up, and I'll put the key also uh, over the weekend. You should have that on Moodle. OK, I think these are all my announcements. We can move on and continue with proximate analysis. And um, refresher, what's proximate analysis? Who's going to volunteer? Proximate analysis. Not Andy and not Aaron. I'm going to go with Josie. So it's the study or the determination or the analysis of macromolecules or macro components of your food, which are? Farah? One more. What's your advisor's oh, <laughs> <laughs> OK, so yes. So And it's called proximate because we approximate the values. We don't necessarily accurately measure the exact amount. All of the methods are crude methods of determination. And that's why they're called proximate analysis of the macro components. OK. So we finished ash last time. We're going to move on to fat. And to start off, which of the following is true? All right, Ben? What were you going to say, Claire? Anybody else? Nobody's going to challenge that, Sarah? So. Okay, so Sarah challenged, but <laughs> she's taking it back. <laughs> All right, so A is the correct term. So yes, it's a combination. Oil and fat are both the lipids. And um, actually, oil has lower melting point than fat, which makes it a liquid at room temperature, whereas fat is solid at room temperature. And that's the differentiation between oil and fat, really, is their melting point and their physical state of matter at room temperature. OK, and then fat has higher saturated fatty acids compared to oil. And the saturated fatty acid gives them this higher melting point um, characteristic. So it's only A. What about this one? The lipid portion of the food? Come on, those that rarely participate, go ahead. I would go with Drew. Um, uh, what do you want to say, Jenny? Anybody else? Can all the fat? Speak or the lipid be completely extracted with ethyl ether? No. 
So it is really vitamin A and D are extractable with the lip with the fats and oil. So they are fat soluble vitamins. So since they are fat soluble vitamins and they're extracted with organic solvents, they're part of the lipid components. And and they fractions of lipid do vary in polarity. For example, triglyceride is very hydrophobic. Phospholipid is not as much, is a slightly polar, um, it's a polar lipid. So A and B are correct, and the fact that they vary so much in polarity and composition, there's not one solvent that can extract all efficiently. Okay, so what's the definition of lipid? We mentioned it last time, but it's a very simple definition, really. Not soluble in water, soluble on organ in organic solvent. So everything that is not, not completely miscible with water. So that's the simple definition for lipid. And because of that, there are so many different components and fractions that fall within the lipid component. And the most common is your triglyceride which is a glycerol with three fatty acids. That's your typical uh, composition. But it's not only that. You have di and monoglycerides. They are part of your lipid, but they're more polar components. You have other esters, like vitamin uh, A is an ester of fatty acid, but has a different alcohol group. And you have the compound lipids, where you have uh, lipids that are conjugated with, with other function group, like phospholipids. So you have a phosphate here, you have a glycerol, and you have uh, two fatty acids associated with that phosphate group and the alcohol. So here you have your polar head, and then this is the nonpolar tail, and it's a, a lecithin, for example, is a phospholipid, and that's why lecithin is a great emulsifier because of the fact it has a phosphate uh, polar head and nonpolar tail. So there are lipoproteins, like lipoproteins in egg, egg yolk, for example, there are quite a few of them. Glycoproteins, uh, glycolipids, sorry, there are lipids with a, a carbohydrate group associated with them. And then the cerebrosides it can be found in the brain. Um, so they have carbohydrate group, a phosphate group, and sometimes a nitrogen group as well. Uh, derived lipids, so these would be free fatty acids are not really lipid. They are derived from triglycerides. And then a long chain alcohol that when you break down uh, your free fatty acid, you get the alcohols and then the hydrocarbon chain and fat-soluble vitamins. There are, these are all derived lipids, not necessarily lipids directly. Why do we care about fat and acids? Why is it important? For what reason we measure fat? Come on, obvious reason. Jashu? Nutrition label. Another obvious reason. Health claims, yes. Shelf life. Shelf life. That's a good one. Michelle, Amy's gonna love you now because that's what she cares about. No, but you like you you like that answer, didn't you? Though. I love shelf life. You love. <laughs> you measure the amount of fat because that will contribute to rancidity. The higher fat amount you have and the higher endogenous enzymes that would cause hydrolytic rancidity or oxidative rancidity, then the more um, problems you're gonna have in, during shelf life. So that's one thing. So what did we say? Nutrition label, shelf life, and health claims. Are there anything else? Can't remember, let's see what I have. Well, regula regula regulatory requirement. Oftentimes, some of you uh, are working on project with standard of identity for some of the uh, products. So there's always, uh, like cheese, there's certain milk fat uh, to meet the standard of identity for a certain product. Um, 
also manufacturing specifications. For example, milk is sold based on, uh, the price of milk is based on the amount of fat and amount of protein you have, especially fat. So what would be your specification for selling a certain product at a particular level of fat? So meeting a standard of identity and then whatever your manufacturer specification is. And in addition to stability and the health claim is good because you want to say fat free or 30% uh, reduced fat or, well actually this is not health, uh, not this, uh, okay I made the same mistake that many of you did in the exam. There's a difference between nutrient claim and health claim. What is the difference between a nutrient claim and a health claim? Drew. So the health claim is how to associate to certain diseases like cholesterol and cardiovascular diseases versus nutrient claim. How much is in there? One third reduced uh, fat uh, or high uh, good source of calcium or stuff like that. So these are nutrient claim versus health claim. And many, some of you, I'm not going to say many of you, put nutrient claim for that one question in the exam versus health claim. Uh, which was the calcium and osteoporosis is the answer to that one question rather than a good source or an excellent source of calcium. Okay, I drifted, didn't I? Let's move on. <laughs> okay, so there are different ways to extract the fat and determine uh, fat content. So there are the continuous methods for extracting fat and measuring fat amount and this is a goldfish apparatus and we'll talk about that. In the lab what you did is semi-continuous and this is soft it. I'll, I'll go over it quickly but now you know it very well from the lab. And then the discontinuous solvent extraction where you use solvents but it is a, not a continuous process, it's a batch process which you also did in the lab. Um, and then there are a couple more superfluid uh, extraction, supercritical fluid extraction, and accel accelerated uh, solvent extraction. So you elevate the pressure and temperature to have a e more efficient extraction of fat over a short period of time. And obviously you have the GC method, which is the AOAC method that is used to determine the fat amount to put on your label which where you determine fame and you convert all of those to triglycerides and you report them as uh, total fat. So you, you don't use any of these methods for nutrition labeling, you use the GC method for nutrition label. So there are a couple more that are non-solvent extraction where you don't use organic solvent at all and these are uh, Babcock and Gerber, they're very related. They differ slightly in the protocol and the, um, the utensil that you use. I meant to bring a Gerber uh, flask but, and a Babcock flask actually, but I forgot. But I have a picture of it. And then there are also the instrumental method like the IR. IR you can do mid IR or near IR like we talked about when we covered the IR chapter. But these methods need to be calibrated with official methods of analysis, obviously, in order to use them reliably. And then we'll talk about a couple more instruments, the Fosley method based on specific gravity, and then the NMR. So these are the different uh, methods that are commonly used for different products. So obviously to choose a method, or to, to start a method, you have to see what sample preparation you need to do prior to, um, prior to extraction of the sample or the fat. So this has to do with the type of food. Type of food, is it a high moisture food? Does it require um, removal of moisture like we did for the cheeses for Soxlet? Is it um, high carbohydrate food where you need a digestion step like you did in Mojiner? Is it a high protein food like you did for the cheese? You had to solubilize the curd in order to release the fat. So we had done a sodium, uh, not sodium, ammonium hydroxide overnight. 
So it really, the type of food dictates how you prepare your sample. And then the nature of lipids. We talked, I talked with each group uh, slightly about what type of lipids you would have, and based on that, you would select a solvent. So for stocks that we went with the cheapest solvent, which is a petroleum ether, however, if you know that your sample is high in phospholipids, for example, you want some polar organic solvent put in there in the mix, and that would be a uh, diethyl ether. So if you know what your nature of lipids, you can, based on that, choose uh, a mixture of solvents or one solvent. Um, and then the extraction method. This takes uh, this extraction method to choose. It's mostly in all, almost all cases, what do you have available in the lab? You might not have a Mojiner available in the lab. You might not have a Soxlet available in the lab. So what's the availability is one thing. And then if you have both, then you can look to see okay which one would be more accurate for the for the type of food that I have. For example, since Mojiner has um, a step where you hydrolyze or you solubilize, hydrolyze your carbohydrate or solubilize your protein, then that would be more efficient for a high carbohydrate or high protein um, sample. So you will notice when you get your results back, if you did the experiment correctly, for high carbohydrate food, you'll see that the Mojina is a better uh, method than Soxlet, yes, Jeshu? Yeah. Okay. So, depending on uh, the food product that you have and depending the availability in your lab, then you can select the method. All right. We kind of answered some of that. What would you need to do here? Yes, John? All of the above in certain cases. So for uh, Soxit, for example, if you have more than 10% uh, moisture content of a product, you need to uh, dehydrate it. But for Mojino, you don't need that pre-drying step because there are, there's going to be phases, the aqueous phase and the, and the solvent phase, so you don't have to really remove the water because you're going to separate the phases. Acid hydrolysis, like I said, if you have a lot of carbohydrate in your sample, then you want that. But if you're determining fat in meat, for example, Soxlet will be very good and efficient. Particle size reduction, well, this is really important. I can tell you a story for a capstone group. You will relate to that when you're doing your capstone. So there was a capstone group working on a product that is uh, potato chips. And they wanted to determine the proximate analysis of uh, proximate components of their sample. And then one of them was fat, and they were going to do Mojiner because it's high carbohydrate food. And then they took the method, and off they go. As a capstone, you're more independently running stuff than in a lab set. So I walk, I walk in in the lab, and I see a Mojiner flask, and in it, a one single piece of a potato chip. And it's like, guys, what are you doing? Extracting the fat? <laughs> I was like, oh, no. You have to really, <laughs> how are you going to extract the fat from a matrix that has not have a, a high surface area? So you don't want to do that. Try to remember this when you're the capstone group trying to um, measure fat content. So definitely we want to reduce particle size. Do you remember from? Chapter 5, what would be the best mesh number for fat extraction? 40. So it's 40. 20 is for uh, regular, like ash, moisture, protein determination. But for fat extraction, it would be the, the smaller the particles, the better. So 40 mesh means it's finer. It's going to be a finer powder than 20 mesh. OK. Okay, so this is a table from your chapter. It's highlighting the importance of, uh, or the significance of acid hydrolysis. If you look at these products and you look at the percent fat when you do acid hydrolysis versus no acid hydrolysis. So all of them, you will detect more fat when you hydrolyze the sample because now you're breaking up protein, you're breaking up carbohydrate, you're releasing the fat 
from your um, complex matrix. So all of them are. But in, if you're running SOXA, it's really hard to hydrolyze, and then you don't want to have a liquid sample to put in your thimble because the thimble are porous, so you cannot do that. So again, depending on what uh, equipment you're using, but in all of these cases, if you have acid hydrolysis, you'll have better fat extraction. So solvent selection, like we talked earlier, it's really key if you know what the components of your lipid are. Um, so there are certain characteristics that would be ideal. You don't want solvent that would solubilize proteins or carbohydrates because these would be contaminants of your, uh, in your solvent and will cause overestimation. So you want to select solvent that proteins and carbohydrate will not solubilize. Low boiling point, because you, want to, you don't want to use a lot of uh, heat and you want it to be an efficient process and you want it to be quick. So you want something that will boil at low temperature and get a more efficient evaporation. Non-flammable, this is a big one, but with diethyl ether, for example, it is flammable and we need to be cautious. Non-toxic, um, like Erin today had a headache from ethyl ether, right? Some people are very sensitive to ethyl ether. We do work under the hood, but still fumes escape. And some people cannot tolerate that, uh, but cannot prevent it. Non-hygroscopic, we talked about uh, diethyl ether being hygroscopic. That means it capture moisture from atmosphere, it can capture moisture from your sample, it becomes more polar, and therefore it becomes less of an efficient solvent. And you want something inexpensive, like we did in Soxit. Per sample, you're using 350 milliliter. How much is the pet ether, Amy, do you know? Uh, yeah? Yeah, but do you have like this four, the, the four liter? Oh, so it's not very expensive, so we can, but the diethyl ether is more. Do you have a number for that? Okay, so you have about more than four times the cost. So that's why in Soxlate we went cheap and we, put, we used pet ether. Um, is there a solvent with all these characteristics? Not really. So no, it's really hard to find one solvent that is that great. So the solution would be, well, before we talk about solution, let's put them side by side. So ethyl ether, we say, is generally better solvent for fat or lipids, basically, versus petroleum ether that is selective more for hydrophobic lipids. Petroleum ether is more hydrophobic than diethyl ether. So if you have your sample is mostly triglycerides, then petroleum ether is really a good one, but if you have a range of different types of lipids, then you need diethyl ether in there to extract uh, some of that more polar lipid. So we talked about more expensive, cheaper, here greater danger of explosion and fire hazard because we have lower boiling point, not by much, but still, it makes it more uh, flammable. Um, and then we, we talked about the fact that it's hygroscopic versus pet ether, uh, less hygroscopic or not as, um, as much of a problem there. I think the diethyl ether that you used in the lab was called dehydrated diethyl ether, making sure that it does not have any moisture in it. So here's the goldfish apparatus, which used to be very common back in the days. And actually, when I was a student, that was the um, apparatus we used for proximate analysis. And also, when I taught in a different university a few years back, I used this. And I'll tell you the story in a minute. But so basically, what you have, I'm going to draw it. You all saw the socks lit. So I will tell you the differentiation between the goldfish versus the socks lift. So what you have here, this compartment up here is your condenser. 
So you have water going through and cooling. And then here's your uh, hot plates. So you turn the heat on so they're hot. And then you adjust the height. And then here, which you can't see very clearly, what you have is you have a beaker where you put your solvent in. So solvent, so it's a flask and it's round so you can screw it on uh, the condenser. So that would be here your solvent. And then also there is an internal um, compartment where you can also screw in internally another uh, another glass material that is open. So here there is a hole, it's not closed. And in it, you have your thimble. You put your thimble in, the one that you have done in the lab. So basically you weigh in your sample, you put it in the thimble, and then you put it in this inner glass tube, which is open from here, and then you put the whole assembly, you attach it to the condenser, and then you apply heat, and what's going to happen is your solvent's going to boil, evaporate, and then condenses in here, but it's not going to soak your sample. Unlike in Soxit, you've seen that there was a sample compartment that is closed and your sample is soaked, and the solvent has time to extract the fat or solubilize the fat. But here, what happens is it just goes through into the speaker. So the fat just goes through. So that's what we, we talked about earlier in lab. That's called channeling. There's a chance of channeling, meaning the sample going up and down in your sample and not enough time to carry fat and go in. So oftentimes the solvent just channels through and not carry any fat with it. That's why it's an inefficient process versus the socket that is a, has a soaking step. But here's what happened one time when I was teaching this lab. And if you don't screw this on very well, you're going to have a leak. And I was working with not petroleum ether, I was working with ethyl ether. So I was standing by the hood, and the students were behind me. So I was protecting the student like the mama duck, right? So, so I was standing there, and then I did not screw it on very well. And then so the solvent evaporated, condensed. And instead of going into the sample, it went everywhere on the hot plate. And guess what happened? Boom. Guess how it happened to me? No eyebrows, no eyelashes. My fringe here was all burned. But I maintained my looks, so I'm still OK. <laughs> <laughs> but it was nothing happened to the student. Otherwise, I'll be sued. But um, yeah, so everybody survived. I just got the blow. So basically, it's very dangerous to work with ethyl ether and not make sure that everything is safe and no leak. You need to check that before you turn it on the heat. So socks, you've all seen. I'm not, yes? You see, that's, that's, I've always asked myself this question. I don't know why goldfish. Maybe somebody a fan of a goldfish like Amy is? <laughs> Do you know why Amy is a goldfish? Huh? She has a memory span of a goldfish. So does does the goldfish has good memory? So Amy, we have to find you another nickname. Huh? <laughs> Go, yeah? Well, anyway, I don't know what the origin of the name is, but. Good. All right, so Soxit, you've all seen. You know how it works. I'm not going to repeat it. It's a, a just quickly, it's a semi uh, continuous. So you have the soaking step, and it, the cycle keeps going of evaporation and condensing into the sample, soaking, and then siphoning back to the original container. So it's more efficient, it takes less time, and it's more accurate than goldfish. But do you think it's hazard-free? Here's what I did. 
when I first came here. Okay, so I've never seen a Soxlet before coming here uh, because I only had worked with goldfish apparatus. So basically I thought, oh, this looks safer. And I did not ask DTA at the time to put it under the hood. And, <laughs> and then we put the apparatus out on the benches and then the we put the samples in and the TA cranked up the heat as much as he could all the way up. So what do you think happened? So it was evaporating faster than the condenser. And then all of a sudden I saw the, the I saw the <laughs> um, the solid just coming out of the top of the oh my god, another explosion. Go out <laughs> got the student out of the lab and I ran out of the lab too but I <laughs> but I did turn off <laughs> the heater but I, I wasn't ready to burn again so <laughs> but anyway it's not safe it has to be under the hood and make sure that the heat is not too hot otherwise you will have uh, an issue so okay So both goldfish and Soxlet methods are gravimetric. So this is a term that I've seen a lot of you in the project preliminary summary use the word gravimetric method. So gravimetric method is not the descriptive name of a method. So Soxlet and goldfish is gravimetric. Ash, dry ashing is gravimetric. All it means is you take a measurement, a weight. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't tell you what the method is. So those of you that have uh, done their preliminary summary and put gravimetric, I made sure to correct you and say this is not a descriptive name for your method. But that's what it means, is basically you, may, you take a measurement and from that measurement, uh, your weight, you will get your percentage. Um, so in this case, let's say the percent fat on dry bases, if you have cheese, in this case it's the direct method, unlike what we did in, in the lab, you measure the beaker weight or flask plus fat and then minus the beaker or flask empty, you get the amount of fat and you divide it by the gram of dry sample. What you did in the lab is actually, because we don't want to evaporate 350 milliliter of uh, ether, what you're going to do is measure the weight after fat extraction. Well, you want in not well. That was a standardized volume that allows enough uh, material to evaporate, and you don't go to dryness at the bottom of the flask, and you just have a continuous flow to fill the compartment. If you don't have enough solvent, you won't have enough solvent to fill that sample compartment to where it soaks the sample. So that number was found experimentally and determined to be sufficient. Um, Okay, so if you do that, and then if you get the fat on dry bases, let's do an exercise. Pull out a piece of paper for a plus two. You're gonna be doing a lot of these calculations. going we have about 14 minutes so let's get going with this this is a practice because you're going to do a lot of these calculations for the lab report so I just want to make sure that you know how to do them All right, so what's the equation? What do I do? 
So I want percent fat on wet bases. What would it be equal to? So percent fat on dry bases. And then, what's that? 100 minus moisture content over 100. Okay. So that would be, the 100 is the weight, is the percentage weight, obviously, of the entire sample. And this is, is, the, is the weight of your dry matter. So if you take that, then you will get the fat on flat bases. So what would it be? Huh? 12%. So, and to check your calculation, always, always on dry bases, your percentage is higher than on wet bases because the denominator is lower. So your mojiner, or in French, mojonier, it's a discontinuous uh, solvent extraction. And you all did this already. So you've got a sample that has either been um, overnight solubilized with ammonium hydroxide if it's high in protein and protein that is in a curd form, like in the cheese. And then, or if it's high in carbohydrate, you digest it in HCL in a water bath for 30 minutes. So either treatment based on the, the, the sample that you had, and you added alcohol, alcohol, ethanol. Why did you add alcohol? This is one of your questions for your lab report. What's that? So prevents gelation of a protein, and also prevent, um, what's the word, huh? Ag Clumping of a high carbohydrate a product. So basically you don't want that to happen because if the protein gel or the carbohydrate clumps, what's going to happen is the fat is going to be entrapped in that matrix and then you won't get it well extracted. So you put the alcohol in there to disperse everything really nicely and then also to allow for the separation of the phases because the alcohol also prevents formation of emulsion. You know how protein likes to emulsify fat, but if you have alcohol in there, it's going to disperse that protein and you won't get that layer between the aqueous and the organic phase that is emulsified where your fat is trapped in the middle. So alcohol helps with that. And you use the combination of ether and petroleum ether. The volumes were reasonable, so you were able to use combination of them. And you applied the extraction uh, two times? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then in this case, you don't have to remove moisture because you're going to have two phases anyway, where you have water and um, your uh, solvent. So. And then you centrifuged, you took the supernatant, you put it in a flask, you dried it, and you got your fat content. Pretty simple. So the supercritical fluid extraction utilizes carbon dioxide at elevated pressure and temperature where it becomes liquid. So you will have a liquid solvent that is uh, carbon dioxide, very nonpolar solvent, and then you would have your compartment where your sample is, and then the CO2 is pumped under pressure, and then you will have the extraction occurring here, and then the solvent with the fat gets pumped into the collection tube, and here, as soon as it leaves the pressurized system, it will go under room temperature, not room temperature, pr uh, atmospheric pressure. And once the CO2 hits atmospheric pressure, what's going to happen to it? It will just turn to gas, and then you'll have the fat. You don't need to uh, have an evaporation step. 
So it's pretty neat, and it's sometimes linked to GC if you want to extract flavor components, then that would be another um, way to do it and link it to GC and have um, measurements there. Uh, sometimes you add methanol to CO2 so that you will have a little bit more polar solvent for, um, for if you have uh, lipid components that are more polar to make, to make sure you have efficient extraction. This one is elevated pressure and temperature here. It's not really CO2. You can use any, any solvent. You can use ether or, um, or methanol or hexane or chloroform, any, any solvent really. But the, the thing about this is you heat under pressure. So what happens to the boiling point? What? Under pressure, it increases. With, under vacuum, it decreases. So with pressure, you will have a longer, uh, the solvent will not evaporate very fast, so you can increase the temperature and have more efficient fat extraction at high temperature and under pressure. And then you can actually run it under static mode, where you close this valve here, and then you just soak your sample. Or you can have a dynamic mode, where, sa where solvent is continuously um, washing your sample and going into a collection vessel. So the non-solvent wet extraction method, this is mostly for dairy, so for cream, for cheese, for milk. So these are were developed really for uh, milk fat, dairy fat. So in this case, no organic solvent. What's happening here is you use a concentrated acid, sulfuric acid, and you weigh an, an exact amount, always a constant amount, of let's say milk versus sulfuric acid. So the milk is 17.6 milliliter exact is what you would put, and also 17.5 milliliter of sulfuric acid. These are exact volume, and again they were found experimentally to be the volume that you need to choose. So once you put your milk here and you add the sulfuric acid, um, what you would get is, it's an exothermic reaction, so what you'll have is heat generated, and then the sample starts to burn because it's been digested. So your protein and carbohydrate are going to uh, get digested, and the fat, because of the heat, will get, will get released, and then what will happen, the fat will build up uh, here in your um, the graduated compartment of the flask and you'll actually take the volume measurement of your fat. So there are different um, types so this would be for milk, this is for cream, this is for cheese uh, so different flasks for different types of dairy that you would use. <coughs> So here in this case, the fat is measured volumetrically, um, not gravimetrically. And you don't need to dry the sample. So the Gerber method is very similar um, method. It's the European version of the, of the method. And they have slightly different shape of flask, but it's basically the same principle. But you use different volumes, and here you put uh, in addition to sulfuric acid, you add amyl alcohol. And the amyl alcohol is actually prevent charring of sugar. Charring of sugar, that means the sugar will burn, but it will not combust. Um, so it will prevent that if you have samples high in sugar. Um, so otherwise, similar principle. So here, if it's a volumetric, let's use that same piece of paper and try to figure that out. Um,
So what's the first thing you want to do? So you have volume. You want to convert it to weight, right? And you have the density. But all you have is a percentage. So what you would do is you would assume um, that you have 100 milliliter of sample, right? Of that, you have 3.5 milliliter of fat. So you want to convert this to mass and this to mass. So the density of 100 milliliter of milk, so you multiply that by the density, you get the weight or the mass of the milk, of 100 milliliter milk. And then the 3.5 milliliter of fat, you multiply it by its density of 0.9, then you get the weight of a 3.5 milliliter. Once you do that, then you have the weight of the sample and the weight of the fat, then you can get the percentage in mass, in weight basis. Okay? So last slide, um, I think. Yep. So instrumental methods, so like I said, you use infrared spectroscopy, which is based on absorption of um, IR radiation by fat. So if you're using um, mid-IR, you would be measuring carbonyl group stretching or bending. If you're using near-IR instrument, so the mid-IR usually is used for milk products. Near IR can be used for anything, and it, you would measure CH stretch and bend of CH um, groups in fat. So, but it does require calibration against the standard method. You cannot apply it without calibration. And it's a fast method, online method for quality control. The FOSLE method, you extract the fat with perchlorine, uh, perchloroethylene, basically, and the extract that has the fat, you measure the specific gravity, and there are charts that you can converse, convert specific gravity to a fat. Finally, NMR, uh, which is also, it is simple in terms, it's automated and computerized, but it's not really simple to understand the principle of the spectra but there are methods to use for determining fat content using NMR. Okay, with that, I'm done. I'll see you on Monday, but do come for Chelsea on Friday. She's giving a lecture. All right. <laughs>